Hi everyone, thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, we will be presenting on common profitless faults found within industry and provide suggestions on how these faults can be found, corrected and prevented. My name is Carl Ruiz. I'm uh, currently the chairman of the Profitless and Profitnet organization of Southern Africa. Uh, I also head up the academy at Industrial Data Exchange, which is one of these certified training centers uh, for Profitless and Profitnet technologies. I spend most of my time offering certified courses on Profibus and Profinet technologies, as well as conducting engineering services on site associated to industrial ICT type systems, which typically includes mainly fault finding and auditing of industrial communication networks. So in our discussion today, we'll cover the following main points that I feel are very relevant for this topic. Uh, common Profibus faults. Uh, the first will be termination related faults. Next, we'll look at EMI and grounding related issues device connections and common faults created within device connections, faulty device and power supply issues, training and diagnostic tools that you can assist your team. But firstly, let's have a look at terminations. So one of the most common faults for profitless DP installations is referred to as an under termination. To understand what an under termination is, let's firstly understand what is meant by termination and where should a termination be enabled. A termination is simply a set of resistors or a resistor circuit that is designed to capture excess energy from the bus once the telegram signal reaches the end of the line. So you basically have all this energy traveling from some station that has transmitted a telegram, and once it reaches the end of the cable, it will bounce back and cause what we call reflections, which can interfere with future communications. Terminating resistors are typically enabled to prevent these reflections um, for future transmissions. Profibus typically requires two power termination resistor circuits per segment. These resistor circuits are built into Profibus connectors and some devices, um, and you enable them by simply turning on a simple switch on a connector or a switch on a device. A segment is an electrically continuous or piece of Profibus cable that links multiple devices and components together through connectors, typically sub D9 connectors, Phoenix connectors, or M12. Segments are split with the use of repeaters and fiber optics. So typically a given Profibus network would consist of multiple different segments because you have what about 125 device addresses you can connect into a single network. And we use multiple segments because you have certain limitations as to the total number of devices you can have in a segment, uh, total distance of a segment. And these are split again with repeaters and fiber optic modules. Now on every single segment, I have to have two terminations, one at the beginning and one at the end. In many instances of an industry, these required terminations are either disabled or missing from either or both ends of the segment. This results in reflections, or alternatively, these terminations are unpowered. When I say powered, it is important to note that a terminating resistive circuit requires power to create an idle voltage on the bus and protect the bus from interference and impedance related faults. The power from this termination circuit often comes from the device with which the profit bus, um, with which the profit bus connector is connected to or the terminating circuit is connected to. If this device is locked out, powered off, or the terminating profit bus plug is disconnected from the host and just left in the panel, then the idle voltage will not be maintained at its required one volt, and you're gonna suffer from these interference related issues. Um, and network is typically gonna be more um, at risk from other installation type faults. A very quick and easy way to remember where the termination should be enabled is typically where there's only one cable going into a connector. This isn't a hard fast rule because of the dynamics of how your whole segment is designed and if you're using stub lines or not. Uh, but generally where you have one cable going into a connector or into a device, that should be the end of the segment. Um, an easy way to identify if there's an undetermination in the segment is to look at the signal quality of the bus telegram. When I talk about signal quality, the signal that is generated on the bus, if you had to connect in a high speed oscilloscope and you have a look at the amplitude of the signal, uh, that should typically be between 2.5 to 7.2 volts. Uh, according to the specification. Uh, from experience, that should actually be probably at less than seven volts and more than about three to four volts. When it starts dipping below those values, you can have a bit of issues as well. And an unpowered termination is identified if you look at the idle voltage of the string and it's, if it's below one volt, then you obviously have an unpowered termination somewhere within the segment. A very common place where I find uh, accidental missing terminations would be on diagnostic repeaters. Here's an example of a Siemens diagnostic repeater. How this device typically works uh, is you have one segment which connects into this first connector over here. You have a second segment coming out of just this port, and then you have a third segment coming out of that port. So it basically creates or enables two additional segments from the first. 
the idea of the first one is you could daisy chain in and go back out of the um, diagnostic repeater to connect them within the middle of one segment, and then you can create two other segments in that. Now, what you will see is that I have one cable coming into this connector, which means that I should probably terminate because it's the end of the segment, right? These two ports over here are automatically terminated because they're the beginning of the next two segments. Now, if you have a look at the switch over here, the switch is indicating that the termination on DP1 is off, which means that there is actually an under termination in this scenario. Uh, so that is something to keep an eye out for as well. And the other switch over here just allows you to disable segment three if it's not being used. Sometimes you can use this device just by enabling segment two. Just as bad as an under termination, if not actually worse, um, is something called an over termination. I mentioned in the previous slide that each segment should have two terminations per segment. Um, if I ever hear more than two terminations enabled, or the terminations are enabled at the wrong point, then the system would be subject to what I refer to as the segment being over terminated. From experience, I've found a common place where over terminations is unintentionally enabled is within BSDs, soft starters, and uh, some process analyzers. In this picture to the right, uh, you can see that the cover has been removed off a of BSD. Uh, you'll see that the Profibus cable comes into a Profibus sub D9 connector and then it daisy chains out. So this is obviously not the end of the segment. It's actually, in fact, the middle of a segment. Uh, this connects to a chassis of the BSD and then you have a cable that runs up here in the internal um, BSD to this card over here, which is actually a Profibus interface card. On this Profibus interface card, you have some indicator lights. You have two row through dials, which allows you to hard set the Profibus address, uh, which obviously has to be unique. And then there's this double pole blue dip switch over here. And you can see it's in the up positions on. This is an extremely common scenario. And what has actually happened here, by turning this on, you enabling that resistor circuit, which is built into this card. But now by adding excess resistance into the middle of a segment, what you're doing is you're decreasing that quality I spoke about a little bit earlier. And that's going to make the voltages uh, drop and the signal quality of future devices and causes severe communication um, issues uh, within the network. When you see, um, so typically when you see a voltage, so you connect in your um, high speed oscilloscope, something like ProfiTrace, uh, you have a look at your signal qualities and you notice that everything's typically below 3.5 volts, maybe a little bit lower. Uh, a good place to start is open up any VSDs uh, which are connected within the segment and ensure that this dip switch is disabled. There is another way which uh, over terminations are typically enabled on a device and that is through the interconnection of cables using um, piggyback plugs. So typically this isn't the best practice, there's nothing wrong with it. it. The system will work, but the reason this is bad practice is because you can accidentally create these over terminations within a segment. So what happens here is you have an incoming cable going to the plug, connects to the device, and then the signal goes back out. But in this case, we actually have a double over termination because you've got a terminating resistor enabled on the bottom plug, and you have a terminating resistor enabled on the top plug, which is definitely going to bring down those signal voltages and affect um, future or communications across the entire bus. So my recommendations here is, well, obviously make sure that both these uh, terminations are off, or alternatively, don't connect cables like this, rather just wire it into one cable. The reason you wouldn't typically be able to create an overtermination just with a single plug is that when you enable this termination, it actually cuts off the outgoing line of the plug, which means that you would obviously lose a couple of devices in the segment. You'd be able to identify there's a fault almost immediately. So overterminations, very big problem and something that's very quick and easy to fix um, on your networks. The next topic we're going to look at is EMI and grounding related issues. So there are two forms of interference that affect communication systems such as Profibus. Uh, and these interferences are especially prevalent to Profibus due to the environments with which Profibus is designed to operate and installed, like motor control centers. And it's often working around very high voltage and high, switch, uh, high frequency switching um, within the uh, industrial environments. The first, uh, the first form of interference is something called electromagnetic interference. This is caused by running your Profibus cable in close proximity, more within like 20 centimeters of high voltage power lines and motor power supply cables. When the power cable is energized, especially with a high frequency switching current such as a VFD's output, it causes a pickup on close profibus cables and can damage the telegrams traveling between the IO stations. This type of fault can be identified with the aid of a bus monitor, uh, such as something like ProfiTrace, and is indicated by sporadic and increasing illegal telegrams. Illegal telegram is a statistic which indicates that a message traveling on the bus has been damaged in some form and it ends up getting discarded by the receiving station. 
If you connect the high-speed oscilloscope on the bus, you will notice intermittent deformation of the wave um, and even an occasional overlaid sort of sinusoid. Um, and if you connect it to mains power, this is probably going to be at about 50 hertz. The second is electromagnetic interference. Electromagnetic interference is caused by running the Profbus cable close to noisy devices such as VSTs, turbines, or arc furnaces. Uh, and this often occurs within the connection of the large uh, high kilowatt VSDs uh, within the segment. The idea is to try and avoid running the cable next to the VSD where not completely possible. Um, so, the, uh, typically to identify this type of fault, the symptoms are very similar to that of electromagnetic uh, interference. Um, however, um, Sorry, the electromagnetic interference symptoms are very similar to that of electrostatic interference. However, you find that the faults are a little bit more continuous and less intermittent than that of electrostatic interference. So now you've identified that you have EMI interference in your network. A simple fix is to firstly, where practically possible, move your Profbus cable away from the source of interference, at least 20 to 30 centimeters away from any high voltage cables. And by high voltage, I mean anything that's typically above 100 volts AC or DC. Um, there is a, uh, you can actually, um, when you attend the training, there's a sort of guideline depending on the voltages. If it's above 400 volts, it has to be over 20 centimeters. Below 400 volts is normally about uh, 10 centimeters. Um, and avoid running over any BSDs uh, within the panels where not completely necessary. Secondly, it's very important to ensure that the screen of your cable is properly grounded at each device and that each device is properly bonded to a ground point. The device is normally bonded to a grounding point through DIN rails um, or else through a separate uh, earth conductor within the panel. The shield must be continuous throughout the entire segment um, and you cannot use a sort of floating shield method, typically something that you'd use for analog signals or high-speed digital communication systems, unfortunately. Thirdly, ensure you utilize Profibus proper Profibus DP cable. Uh, it employs various protection mechanisms to counteract EMI interference, such as a twisted pair for your A and B lines, shielding and matching the system impedance requirements, which Profibus uh, requires. Here's an example of a cable where the shield has actually just been terminated short. Uh, this is probably because the cable using like a standing knife or not a proper tool to actually strip the cable. Uh, and this is a very big problem because any types of electrostatic interference that is picked up on this cable, electromagnetic interference that is picked up on the cable, is going to travel down this cable and it actually has no path to ground. So it's going to end up affecting the cores within inside the cable. Also, it prevents the cable from employing a defense mechanism called um, active shielding, which actually creates a counteractive force to any of these interferences uh, if you have multiple connections of your shield to a grounding point. So now where the shield connects into a cable, it actually connects to the chassis of the plug, which then connects to the device, which then probably drains through the DIN rail on the back plane of the panel. So grounding related issues, these are a little bit more tricky. Um, grounding related issues are typically identified with intermittent illegal telegrams. Um, you have a very occasional drop networks and sporadic network failure. Uh, the oscilloscope, you don't often pick up sort of that ringing and rippling effect or sinusoid sort of effect of electrostatic and magnetic interference. Uh, where you find grounding related issues is typically copper cable runs uh, between different floors. So you're going from one floor to another. Um, um, or within panels and substations, especially where different power supply sources um, supply different, sorry, you have different transformers supplying different panels uh, within that environment. And what the typical grounding related issues is normally you have a, car a current traveling in a shield due to potential differences where the shield connects in at one panel, connects into the other panel. These have two different ground potentials, so you end up balancing themselves out through the shield, which is very bad news. The other type of grounding related issues would be what I would call a dirty earth. Um, and this is where the whole discussion on functional earth versus protective earth comes in. Uh, and although they all typically would go to the same spike in the ground, earth mat or transformer earth, uh, you should probably have two separate cables to try and keep a sort of clean, high quality earth and a separate uh, protective earth, which would typically be noisy um, due to the components that are connected to it. Grounding systems require careful consideration and planning. Um, and it's also very important that uh, where there's a potential variance between panels, floors, and transformers, 
uh, you utilize fiber optics where possible, especially when running between floors and running between different substations. Fiber optics will make your network completely immune to any potential variance issues. Uh, another thing which is uh, found extremely useful uh, as a fix where you have grounding related issues, uh, rather than um, having quite a, an expensive um, redesign of the whole grounding type system. In some cases, you can get away with multi-channel segmentation using something like a Profihub, which has multiple different channels, allows you to create a startup topology in your Profibus network, will make the devices on the network a lot more immune to these types of interferences, and obviously utilize separate protective earth and functional earth bars. My third topic, uh, let us look at device connections and common faults created within device connections. This is by far the most common cause of Profibus failures and a resultant of um, poorly wired connectors and wiring related faults. A poorly wired connector can cause a short between the signal lines and the screen. The screen consists of very fine hair like mesh wires that are sometimes unintentionally um, make contact with the cores within the plug as well. A pulley wired connector can result in open circuits between A, B and screen, where the A and B don't make good contact, with the screw terminals nor continuity with vampire pins when we use fast connect plugs. Within the connector which I've displayed over here, um, there is a specific metallic bar plate um, within the connector designed to make good contact with the cable screen. If you look at the base over here, you'll see there's a little metal plate at the bottom over here. This metal plate is important as it will actually connect to the screen and it's supposed to make a good bonding contact to the screen and then obviously drain that to a grounding point once it's connected to a host device. Another thing you'll notice within this connector is that these little strands are actually very fine and often Unintentionally, I think it's very easy to make this mistake when these strands will accidentally short out either the red or the green cores of the Profibus plug. You can see this is a pretty pretty poorly terminated connector where the purple screening is not actually properly terminated within the plug. And you can see that the shield is not making good contact on these other side. It's very common that the screen is scored off or cut off completely and the cable is stripped too far back uh, where the cable is not actually making good contact. You'll notice on this side there's four little dentures inside the purple cable and these are there for mechanical strength because the cable actually has a couple of pins which pierce into that outer housing so that when the cable is tugged on it won't actually accidentally come out of the plug. And this is very common often technicians, electricians and that working within panels, running new wires and uh, moving things around and trunking will inadvertently um, pull on this uh, Profibus cable and that can cause issues down the line as well. Um, sometimes connectors aren't screwed properly into devices, especially devices that vibrate, such as VSDs or panels with large mobile machinery. This can result in intermittent comms loss, so ensure that these screws are tight and fastened on these type of devices. This is an example of a well-terminated plug. In fact, the same plug, uh, which has obviously just used a proper um, stripping tool in order to connect it. The shields of both cables are making good contact with the ground bar within the plug and the two purple cables are in such a position that they have good mechanical strength because they're getting clamped by the teeth within the plug. Within Profibus cable, you get two different types of cables. You get solid core and stranded core. Stranded core cables should only really be used in scenarios where the cable is required to bend continuously, such as energy chains. Solid core cable is a lot lower in cost, normally four or five times lower, um, and it's used in all other static scenarios, such as in MCCs, buckets, um, and running wires to rear panels and whatnot. Stranded core cable has to be used in conjunction with only screw type connectors. This is an example of a screw type connector with the Phoenix terminals. Whereas, uh, um, whereas you can also use solid core with a screw type connector. But if you're using a fast type connect plug or something with vampire pins, where you don't actually have to strip the cores, but you simply push the cores into the plug and close it so that it makes continuity, you can only use solid core with these type of plugs. By using stranded core, it ends up sheathing through a couple of the smaller strands, um, and this will work at first, but with a little bit of manipulation, it'll eventually fail. So, how do I search for wiring related faults? Well, this is very easy. We use something called a binary search. And a very useful feature built in Profibus is that all the plugs have that little termination switch. And the termination switch not only enables the termination circuit, but also cuts off the outgoing line, as I mentioned earlier. And the reason this is great is it's very easy for you to identify if there's a fault. So if you had to connect a bus monitor or some oscilloscope and you see that there's, for example, a short circuit on the segment, at one point, 
I would simply move down the segment enabling terminations uh, every so often until the fault goes away. And the closer you get to the fault, then you can obviously identify which plug potentially has a wiring fault related within it. So how can I mitigate this device connection risk, which seems to be such a severe issue? Well, firstly, utilize a proper cable stripping tool. This is an example of a cable stripping tool. It has uh, two blades within it that can be set at different depths. Um, and what it is, the first blade just removes the outer sheathing and the second blade actually scores and cuts off the shield, but leaves a good one centimeter shield to make good contact with that ground bar that I was talking about. And lastly, pay very close attention to the shield strand. Sometimes it doesn't cut through all the shield strands and one will accidentally go up there towards the A and B lines. Uh, and this can be very detrimental and can short out and uh, destroy an entire network on Profibus. Uh, so just grabbing a torch and paying attention when you terminate is, is pretty important. And then obviously as you create new plugs, make sure you test the cable um, and, and test the segment to make sure that it uh, is in a good state. Our last main topic is um, what can we expect to see um, on site related for faulty devices and faulty power supplies? So electronics, even rugged industrial electronic systems do have a lifespan, after which they begin failing and not behaving how they should. These are very frustrating faults to find, um, especially when they are intermittent and the symptoms only appear every few hours. You can find that a device will only every three or four hours uh, show up some symptoms and end up causing failures in the network. And it's not very viable to sit there holding a laptop in a substation trying to catch that fault. A lot of sites I've visited uh, sometimes find the installation could be 10, 15 or even 20 years um, old. And the older devices tend to be a lot more unstable and sensitive to um, faults than newer type components. Also, if devices have been exposed to harsh environmental factors, uh, their performance can be dramatically uh, reduced. Factors such as hot panels. I've been to sites before where they have a Rio panel or a steel Rio panel sitting out. Uh, it's not protected by um, a canopy or some sort of shade or ventilation. Uh, and when you open up this panel, it's typically like 75 degrees uh, Celsius inside it. And that's, yeah, that's going to destroy electronics very quickly. Dust, especially coal dust on some of the coal mines, uh, can short out circuit boards um, and can damage electronics and exposure to exposure to steam water acid and other things like that these devices should be properly protected within higher ip rated uh, panels especially in the process environments my advice ensure that you keep spares in store for all components within your plant um, especially devices reaching 10 to 15 years of age uh, replace components that are identified to be sensitive and prone to faults or failures uh, you again can use a binary search for a constant fault. So some older devices, potentially if the A second side fails, will might create a short um, on the A or the B lines and similar fault finding um, method is used as for wiring faults. You can also test devices directly uh, using a master simulator device. Um, and uh, if you connect it in, disconnect them from the bus, plug straight into your bus testing tool uh, get the device online and you'll see if it's behaving how it should actually um, and that just helps you to isolate that problem per device as well uh, for severely intermittent faults uh, you can install a permanent monitoring tool um, which will take a snapshot of the network upon failure um, and allows you to see what might be causing the issues um, a permanent monitor or something like convex kind of acts like um, a bus monitor such as profitrace uh, but he's permanently monitoring he keeps a log or history so you can log in at any point uh, to pick this up as well I spoke about power supplies, uh, PSUs or power supply issues, and this surprisingly is a very common uh, cause of bus failures. And often on inspection of intermittent comp failures or dead communications in a bus, I'll notice that the power supply is either putting less than the required voltage or uh, no voltage at all. Uh, so typically when doing audits of your plant, uh, I'll check the voltage of power supplies for good operation. Uh, what I'd also recommend is using separate power supplies for your um, Profibus uh, communication cards, so your head stations, and another for your I.O., so your digital outputs, relay outputs, and whatnot. Uh, typically, because as you start finding that uh, relays energize um, and things like that, it might draw excess current, which could create uh, intermittent Profibus related issues if it were the same power supply. Uh, you can also use, uh, you can consider using something like redundant power supplies uh, with the use of diodes or uh, some other great components at the moment that allows you to um, and put two types of power supplies and he will um, automatically switch over if a power supply happens to fail as well. 
And then the last point of topic is going to be training and diagnostic tools. So uh, I think it's very important to empower the people on your site uh, to utilize Profibus and Profinet technologies, uh, whatever systems you have installed. So have a look at the certified Profibus installers and engineers courses. If you have Profibus on your site and you haven't attended, uh, you can contact IDX or Siemens. Uh, they both offer the courses. Um, and if you have alternative technologies such as Modbus, other industrial ethernets, um, seek training out for that as well. Understand how the technology works. Device related training, understand how devices are supposed to work upon failure. What are the um, different LEDs mean on that? What are PLC statistics in that? Um, and what is often very useful is getting the experiential learning for fault finding as well. So if you get an experienced Profibus engineer on your site to go through, do an audit, um, have your technical staff responsible for maintaining these systems actually follow that guy around. Uh, typically, they like to share their knowledge, so they will give a lot of information to that guy on what is the best way to identify faults, correct these faults, um, and he'll sort of obviously identify risks, and that information can be copied um, at a later stage. Uh, if you don't have testing tools, Profibus is a very, very difficult protocol to fault find without a proper bus monitor or high-speed oscilloscope. Um, I mean, like a Profitrace or Profibus troubleshooting kit as a good one, but there's various ones out there that you can explore. So um, have a look and then see if you can get training on these type of systems to see how they work and see what works for your plants. Uh, getting network audits done by certified Profibus engineers. Uh, by attending the certified uh, Profibus engineers course um, at IDX or Siemens, you would be enabled and empowered to actually conduct audits on these plants. Um, and having that certified engineer conduct that audit will help to identify any risks in the network that might cause faults and failures um, at a later stage. Um, and then running a network design for new installations um, or even expansion of existing installations uh, past a experienced Profibus engineer uh, will definitely help prevent um, issues and faults further down the line. And then having support resources uh, such as a PCC online um, is very useful as well.